Coming up on Dr. Kiki's Science Hour, we're talking about the world's highest energy X-ray laser with Dr. John Bozek from Slack. That's up next on Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Dr. Kiki's Science Hour is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Dr. Kiki Science Hour with Dr. Kiki Sanford, episode 56, recorded on July 22nd, 2010. X rays, lasers, and atoms. Oh my. This episode of Dr. Kiki's Science Hour is brought to you by Audible.com. To download a free audiobook of your choice, go to audiblepodcast.com forward slash kiki. Welcome, everyone, to Dr. Kiki's Science Hour, episode 56 on x-rays, lasers, and atoms. Oh, my. I'm Dr. Kiki, and over the next hour, we will really dig into the insides of stuff, or at least dig into how scientists are digging into the insides of stuff. Joining me today from uh, from Slack National Accelerator Lab down in Stanford, Palo Alto area, is John Bozak. He is an instrument an instrument scientist for the AMO instrument. Welcome, John. Thank you for joining me today. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. You're welcome. Hope, hopefully I can make sense of that stuff for you. <laughs> well, there's a lot of stuff everywhere around us and people have been trying to make sense of it for years. So, you know, if we put a little dent into it, <laughs> we, can, we can hope that we've done something. To get started, Slack, the Stanford Linear Accelerator it's laboratory. not laboratory. It used to be a big particle accelerator. And what happened? It's not doing that anymore, but it's getting well, into some really interesting stuff anyway. So it still is a big particle accelerator. The three kilometer long uh, Linac still exists. If you drive down Highway 280, somewhere between Sand Hill Road and, uh, and the next exit, I don't even know what it is because I never go that far. Um, you will cross over the, the LINAC, um, you'll see it going from, from west to east, and it has been repurposed, however, so it, it accelerates electrons still. It uh, was built uh, starting in 1962 to accelerate electrons up to very high energies or very high speeds so that they could crash them into other particles, perhaps uh, positrons or uh, other solid materials, um, and that sort of phase of its research has been completed. They uh, studied what they wanted to study with this instrument, and uh, now we've repurposed it to make it into a, an X-ray laser um, light source. So we still use the same accelerator. We made a few small modifications to it to create a very bright electron beam in very short pulses, which we then convert into X-rays to um, produce the world's first hard X-ray free electron laser. And that is a loaded statement. There's lots of things in there that I can expound on. Uh, I don't know which directions you want me <laughs> there, to go in. There are many, many directions that you can that you can go from there. Um, so, why build? So, you, the way people are selling this is that this is the world's biggest X-ray laser. Is that correct? It's the world's highest energy X-ray laser right now. There are actually two other projects in the world to build these um, hard X-ray, what we call free electron lasers. There's one in Japan that will be starting sometime in 2011. I think they're targeting March or April time frame in order to, uh, or at, at that time, they'll start generating X-rays. And another project in Germany, in Hamburg, that won't be completed until 2015. We had the jump on them because we had the existing linear accelerator, which is the, the hardest part of building a free electron laser, is that you need to accelerate electrons up to on the order of 10 GeV or billion electron volts. Um, we, you know, when we talk about the energy of, or the speed of particles, we usually refer to their energy uh, because it's a, a quantity that makes sense. You know, the difference between MeV and GeV in terms of velocity is not very much. Uh, you know, it's a number of nines after the 99.99% the speed of light, um, whereas, uh, you know, in terms of energy, it's, it makes more sense. So we start 
our electrons off at, a, at a, an electron gun. And that electron gun is a, a special electron gun. We use a laser to generate a pulse of electrons so that this pulse is very short in time, very small in, in longitudinal space or, or length. Then we quickly accelerate those bunch of electrons up to this 10 GeV or 13 GeV, depending on the energy that we want to run the experiments at, and, and then uh, use them to generate uh, the light which I will go into in a minute, but I don't want to. I don't want to capitalize on this time and take it all from you. <laughs> Isn't that the point of this show? There you go. <laughs> We're yeah, supposed you sit to get, there and I'm, I talk. Exactly. Yeah. I'm trying to get the information from you on how all this yeah. works. So, yeah. um, so we've got this laser that works at very, very short bursts, and we have the uh, the, the high energy X rays. Um, and and what's the purpose? Of so the creating point, the point, a laser yeah, like this. Yeah, the, I mean, the, normally we think of laser beams. They're hey, they're nice cat toys, mm -hmm. or we're <laughs> <laughs> we're using them in electronics, or um, you know, or they're being being used uh, to to cut through things, or you know, there are many uses. But uh, what right. is this particular laser for? So you know, ever since lasers were invented, there's been a push to go to shorter and shorter wavelengths or, or higher energies with the lasers because at higher energies or shorter wavelengths, you can probe deeper into matter, you can do different, uh, explore different uh, domains of, of how matter is put together. And the wavelengths that we achieve here in the hard X-ray are uh, very good at interacting with the electronic structure of matter so that we can probe its electronic structure. And also at interacting with the structure of matter, we can diffract these X-rays off of the structure of, of matter that we're looking at and, and interrogate that structure. So the reason that we want the very short pulse that you, that you mentioned is matter moves all the time if it's not at absolute zero and the time scale of that motion is on the order of femtoseconds hundreds of femtoseconds tens of femtoseconds it depends on the mass of the particles and what's moving so in order to study that on its natural time scale we need an x-ray pulse that's on that same order uh, of, of time uh, 100 femtoseconds and it's uh, it's intriguing that there's a famous set of pictures from the uh, 19th century where uh, Leland Stanford commissioned uh, Muybridge to uh, take uh, a series of pictures uh, of horses galloping to see if horses had all of their hooves off of the ground at the same time. Right. And so he set up a series of tripwires and had this horse run by a set of cameras. And so each camera flashed and took a picture of, of the horse at that moment that it passed through the tripwire. And, and they proved that, yes, indeed, horses have all four hooves off the ground while they're running. We're doing the same thing, but at the natural time scale of matter, we can look at the motion of atoms and molecules. We can uh, study the, the folding of proteins eventually. We can look at how uh, materials respond to a burst of energy uh, hitting them, like perhaps another laser uh, that we use to excite that, uh, that set of uh, atoms or the solid material um, and, and take strobe photographs of that. Sim very similar to what uh, what Muybridge did for Leland Stanford. So it's it's kind of fun that here we are at Stanford, uh, or just uh, just to the west of Stanford uh, campus, and uh, we're doing the same thing again, but at a much different time scale. Yeah, I think it it just sounds it sounds like such an amazing feat to be able to see into the the moving, the active machinery that makes everything what it is. Um, you're looking at such short time scales. I understand the ability to maybe be able to use the pulses of x-ray light to be able to create, uh, take images to somehow have, uh, have receptors, some, some kind of a receiving device that can take mm -hmm. images of mm -hmm. what the x-rays are illuminating at that the really incredibly fast rate, femtosecond rate, right? right, right. Um, but how do you, how do you, I mean, femtosecond is so small. How do we actually measure at, su at such a incredibly small time scale oh boy uh, that's a good question so we we have lots of different ways of measuring it the electron pulse itself that the that generates the x-rays is on the order of femtoseconds long so it's you know it's moving at some high velocity and it will pass a point um, within 100 femtoseconds and we can measure that in a variety of ways by 
by applying a time-dependent field to those electrons, we will streak them. We will change their position as a function of time. And if we use a field that's uh, you know very fast, that that's going to move things uh, a great distance over over a period of hundreds of femtoseconds, we can see that we can project that motion onto a screen and see those electrons moving. It's harder to see the X-rays at that time scale, but there are. Uh, indirect tricks that we can use. We can do something similar. We just finished an experiment last week, as a matter of fact, where we used a laser, a, a, an optical laser, an infrared laser, to streak electrons that were created by the X-ray pulse. So the X-ray pulse hit an atom, generated electrons with the same time scale as the length of the X-ray pulse, and then they were born in the field of a laser, which which had a, a two micron wavelength. So the field is oscillating up and down uh, from the laser on a period of on the order of uh, four femtoseconds and so electrons that were liberated from the atom in that four femtoseconds would get different energies depending on where in the laser field that they were uh, they were liberated um, and so we could probe the length of the pulse of x-rays uh, by that method wow what, what what does that tell you like probing probing um, an atom in that way, what kind of information do you do you get? Do you, what kind of insight do you get yeah. as to its structure? Or um, so it's 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 uh, structure and it's uh, it's dynamics. You know, this, as I I think I said, it's the natural time scale of matter. So if you really want to understand how a chemical reaction takes place, um, you know, it's it's the reactants and the products that matter, but it's the understanding of how the process moves that will allow you to engineer new processes that will allow you to control matter that will allow you to control uh, chemical reactions so you can generate the products that you want and a lot of those uh, motions are happening in this femtosecond time scale so we need to be able to interrogate matter uh, as it's undergoing these transitions to see you know what's important uh, while it's moving uh, another experiment we recently completed uh, at the LCLS had to do with um, photosystem one and photosystem two which are biological molecules that are responsible for um, absorbing photons from uh, from sunlight and converting them into chemical energy in plants uh, and in the case of photosystem 2 breaking up water and they undergo chemical reactions on this femtosecond time scale that no one has ever been able to observe before and you can imagine if we could engineer um, these sorts of chemical reactions we could harvest light and turn it into energy that we want to use instead of uh, turning it into a corn or something like that um, so we could intercept this process and uh, and use it to uh, to generate very efficiently energy from sunlight. Yeah, it seems like there the the possibilities what you could what you could actually discover and be able to re-engineer would are, are almost endless. There is a little bit of the uh, the kind of uh, mad scientist aspect to this. Is there? Do you think? Um, <laughs> well, like, we, we, we will be able to reconstruct <laughs> anything. Mwaha. We will control matter. Uh, uh, fair enough. Uh, you know, I'm trying to to motivate it with uh, with a very broad societal motivation. You know, as as an atomic and molecular physicist myself, I'm very excited to look at the ionization of krypton and, and understand how that's taking place on its uh, on its natural time scale, which is you know on the order of a few femtoseconds, and and how the electrons rearrange in the krypton atom or the neon atom or or whatever, which is a long way from being able to control um, the harvesting of sunlight by plants. So, you know, as as scientists, we're all motivated by both the big scheme of things that we need to understand nature so that we can we can utilize it uh, in the best ways and also by these very small ideas of understanding how one particular process works in the finest detail that we possibly can and, and you know day to day it's this finest detail thing that we're interested in um, once in a while we have to sell our ideas to uh, to the public and to the politicians and to uh, get them to understand that what we're doing is important steps yeah. on the way to those bigger questions and uh, the bigger societal questions you know we we, we owe that to uh, to the world yeah you're absolutely right um, quick question from the uh, speaking of perspective a uh, quick question from the our chat room what is a femtosecond ah that's a good question a femtosecond is one 10 to the minus 15th of a second. So uh, if you start at seconds, you go milliseconds. You know, we use it, we move in factors of 10 to the 3 typically in these naming schemes. There's milliseconds, microseconds, nanoseconds is 10 to the minus 9th seconds, 
Picoseconds are 10 to the minus 12 seconds, and femtoseconds are 10 to the minus 15 seconds. In a femtosecond, uh, a, a photon or light moves. Uh, now I'm going to get this wrong, aren't I? Because I have no chance <laughs> to uh, sit here and, and calculate it. It's on the order of three microns. Um, uh, so it's it's a, it's very fast. It's uh, I think there's one of the numbers I've heard bantied around is there's as many femtoseconds in a minute as there are minutes in the age of the universe. So it's very small. Wow. <laughs> that gives a little bit of a little bit yeah. of perspective that I was looking for. I think I just yeah. my brain just stopped for a second trying there are to some, contemplate. There are, some, there are some great videos on the web looking at length scales. Uh, you know, looking at these these length scales going from the very small to the to the very large and moving in these factors of ten to the three. You know, from the size of the universe down to the size of a proton. Uh, it doesn't take that many factors of three or ten to the three to move between those two scales. And you know, similarly with femtoseconds to the age of the universe, it's not that many. It's it's a number that you can begin to appreciate. Yeah, but when you start breaking, so when you start breaking uh, the movements or the dynamics of matter, of living, mo of, of proteins, of the elements of, of life up mm -hmm. into these femtosecond scales, you can actually really start to to dig into how stuff works at a, at a time, f yeah. at a time scale that until, that before now, we were really unable to, to just have any any concept of absolutely um, I mean or, with, or just with, by, with by, by modeling right yeah well you know with x-rays so people have been generating femtosecond laser pulses for 20 25 years maybe it's 35 years now um, and as a matter of fact they've moved the next factor of 10 to the minus 3 down into attoseconds um, mm -hmm. which is the time that it takes for an electron to move around a hydrogen atom for example is on the time scale of attoseconds wow. so you're really now in the electronic time scales um, so we're in a bit of a way playing catch up with x-rays uh, there it's harder to make uh, an x-ray laser than it is to make an optical laser and they've made enormous advances in the past 20 years with optical lasers so we're we're not the first ones to be there in the femtosecond time scale, but you know there's been a huge development in X-ray science and technology uh, using synchrotrons. There's one here at at uh, Slack National Accelerator Laboratory that rolls off the tongue. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Called uh, called SSRL, and but there are others around the country uh, in Berkeley and at uh, Brookhaven National Lab in Long Island and around the world, which uh, generate X-rays to look at uh, look at matter, uh, and they have you know a wide variety of applications. But they have a, a much longer time scale. They're not stroboscopic. They're not looking at things moving in their natural time scale. It's the difference between a blurry picture of a race car and that stroboscopic picture of a race car, where you you know you capture it in all of its detail, uh, as opposed to just seeing that it's going really fast. And it's red. Mm. Is there any any way are we going to be able to, as as the general public, are we going to be able to see any pictures of the you know insides of, of molecules, or is most of the data that you're getting back is it um, you know numbers and not something that's actually easily visualized? Yeah, the, we will work on visualizing the data. The, the facility has only been running for 11 months now. We started up in, in August last year, and uh, we've been doing experiments uh, most of the time since then. So we haven't generated necessarily these pretty pictures that, that are accessible to the general public, but we're definitely eager to do that. Um, I had a, a call from uh, from another science show asking me to show them the molecular movie because one of the ways we sell the, the capabilities of the LCLS is the ability to create a, a movie of the motion of, of atoms in, in a chemical reaction in a molecule. Um, and we're on our way to that, but we haven't quite achieved that goal yet. What uh, that requires is shorter uh, wavelengths that are that are just beginning to come online. So we're we're staging the uh, rollout of the capabilities of the LCLS over a period of a couple of years, um, and those are beginning to come online now. And I think we will be starting to generate molecular movies showing the motion of, of atoms and molecules, but it's going to be another another few months yet before we have those available. Yeah, uh, I've, I've seen the strobo stroboscopic images of the horses running and and, mm -hmm. and, and the stuff you, you mentioned earlier in the show, but uh, it just seems it would be so amazing to actually see uh, molecular processes in action to actually be able to look at the inside of photosystem one as a photon hits it or, um, you know, just right. it would just be amazing to actually see what's going on because we have movies, uh, motion graphic visual visualizations that uh, artists have come up with that we, th this is what we think it all looks like.
but right well you know we know what the beginning looks like we know often what the end looks like and we can calculate what pathways it must take or you know it seems to take between those two um, but until we validate those calculations with with experiments we're not exactly sure you know for example in photosystem one or photosystem two there are an enormous number of uh, of molecules or atoms in those molecules and uh, an enormous uh, suite of emotions that are available to them that are energetically available to them which ones are important uh, are, are something that we really need to uh, need to measure uh, in order to understand it in the greatest detail right so you mentioned a, uh, a synchrotron the mm -hmm. SSRL uh, device but you you have you're working at LINAC which is a linear accelerator um, That's right. what it, why use a synchrotron versus a linear accelerator is there a benefit to one versus the other or is it just that we needed a new use or somebody wanted to repurpose the linear accelerator at slack and this just happened to work out uh, no it definitely wasn't a, a case of, uh, of LINAC looking for an application um, uh, synchrotrons are, are exquisite machines to generate x-rays. They generate a very stable beam of x-rays, um, which, which is constant or very close to constant over time so that you can interrogate you know, your, your sample over a long period of time and your source or your light is going to remain constant over that long period of time. Um, they're circular rings. You inject electrons into them. They circulate around the ring millions and millions of times generating x-rays. Each time they go around, uh, you have many electrons in there generating x-rays and so they produce very very beautiful beams of x-rays you can uh, put monochromators on those beams of x-rays and generate very narrow bandwidth so you can study the energy profile of, of electrons or, or the structure of matter in, in exquisite detail the LCLS, on the other hand, is very chaotic. A, a beam of electrons or a bunch of electrons is born at the electron gun. It travels down the LINAC through a series of undulators, which is how we generate the X-rays from, uh, from the electron pulse, and then it's disposed. We, we don't recycle it. We don't, uh, we don't reuse the electrons. And what it means is every pulse is an individual or is a different experiment. So each time we pulse uh, the electrons, they come out a little bit differently. They radiate a little bit differently through the undulators. Uh, so you end up with a slightly different beam quality each time. So we have to measure our, our full data set on each pulse from the, uh, from the LINAC, and those come at eventually 120 hertz. We're currently running at 60 hertz, uh, and in some experiments as low as you know, once every five seconds or something. Mm -hmm. um, the data is so valuable, this, this understanding or this measuring data at the time resolutions that we can achieve is so valuable, it's worth putting up with all of that uh, chaotic nature of the pulses uh, in order to get this femtosecond time scale. So rather than the LINAC being uh, an instrument looking for a purpose, we had this, this idea that was, uh, was born here at Slack to use the LINAC uh, some 20 years ago as, a, as an FEL source um, and, and essentially we're just waiting for it to become available because frankly it's a, it's a billion dollar piece of equipment. If you had to go and build a new one, the, the cost scale of these instruments is on the order of a billion dollars. Wow. So I have a, an image that I found online um, that has a, a number of the, uh, the instruments. It has a, it's a graphic mm -hmm. image of the uh, LINAC. Um, can you kind of take us through the LINAC and the different instruments that, and, and what, what happens as, a, as um, an X-ray or, or particle is shot down the, the hall? I would be happy to. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm seeing the whole image. You're sort of looking at the back half of the, uh, of the LCLS, the, the, the part where the electrons have already been accelerated. So um, I will start up at the electron gun as we, as we talked about, and it's up off the upper left-hand side of, of what I'm seeing on the screen here. The electron gun is, uh, as I said, a laser-initiated pulse of electrons from a copper cathode are accelerated up to uh, very fast, uh, I think 100 MeV, 100 million electron volts in a, in a very short period. And then, then they, and then they're injected into the original slack LINAC, the old copper LINAC that was built in the 1960s. Um, we modified it a little bit with some bunch compressors so that this bunch of electrons is accelerated in the, in the slack LINAC, and it goes through a bunch compressor, which is a magnetic chicane where we can sort of exchange energy spread for time spread. So we, we, uh, we 
make the pulse shorter, give it a little bit more energy spread, then we accelerate it again, go into another bunch compressor to get the very short electron pulse that we need. Then it starts to come into where you see on the picture here in this electron beam transport. So we already have um, an electron beam that's anywhere between 4 GeV, 4 billion electron volts, and 13 GeV, depending on the photon energy that we want to create. So we, uh, as part of the LCLS project, we built a new building across the research yard at SLAC to uh, transport the electrons into the undulator hall from the LINAC. There's about a hundred meters there that we have to span. And so it's a concrete square building that, uh, that houses some electron beam transport. Then the electrons are injected into the undulators. And these are exquisite magnetic devices that are housed in a, in a tunnel that we drilled through the, uh, through the side of a hill uh, at the SLAC site. And inside of that tunnel are 33 uh, undulators. These undulators are three and a half meter long devices with a series of, of permanent magnets which are alternating north and south, north and south poles um, every three centimeters. So in this three and a half meter device you have uh, approximately a uh, hundred periods uh, of, of, uh, of magnet going up and down and then you have 33 of them so you have a thousand periods of, of this magnetic device that cause the electron beam to wiggle back and forth as it passes through this magnetic field uh, that's oscillating uh, every three centimeters. As the electrons oscillate back and forth in that magnetic field, they radiate. Anytime you have a charged particle and you accelerate it, it radiates. That's how you make radio waves. That's how you make uh, a lot of light. That's how you make x-rays from a relativistic electron beam, both at a synchrotron and here at the uh, LCLS. But what happens is because this magnetic device is so long, the light that's radiated at the beginning of the undulator starts to interact with the electron beam because they're co-propagating, they're traveling together in space and time. And that light causes the electron beam to bunch up on the, on the period of the wavelength of the, of the light. So you can imagine the X-ray pulse as a, as a sine wave uh, with a very short period because it's X-rays, very short wavelength. The electrons begin to bunch up on those crests and, and valleys of the, uh, of the radiation. And as they do that, they begin to radiate as a super particle. There's so many of them in, in this little piece of phase space that they, that they radiate uh, coherently. They all radiate together. And that gives you a lot more radiation. And that's how you end up with the, the gain in the, in the uh, laser. So it truly is a laser in the sense that you have light amplified stimulated emission. So the light from the beginning of the uh, undulator re reacts or acts back on the electrons, which then generate more light, which then acts back on the electrons and generates even more light. So you end up with this gain region where the, where the intensity goes up exponentially with the distance down the undulator. And eventually the process sort of reaches saturation. It's, it generates as much uh, light as it can. And then we extract the electron beam because we can use magnets to bend the electron beam and we, and we put it down into an electron dump. The photons, the X-rays from the uh, free electron laser continue straight ahead and that's uh, down beyond the electron beam dump on your picture here uh, into the experimental halls. So we have a near experimental hall, as you can see, sort of in the middle of the picture there, and it has three instruments in it and then a 250 meter approximately long X-ray transport tunnel and then a far experimental hall. The X-ray transport tunnel and the far experimental hall were all tunneled out of a, out of a hillside here at SLAC and reach almost the edge of the, the property. We're uh, you know, a few tens of meters away from the edge of the SLAC site so that we have some, some earth to shield it there uh, and prevent any X-rays you know, from ever possibly leaving the, uh, leaving the area. So in the near experimental hall, the three experiments in order uh, along the beam line or along the, the trajectory of the X-rays are the atomic and molecular and optical physics experiment. That's the one I work with. Then we have in the second hutch something called SXR, the soft X-ray uh, research uh, experiment. And then beyond that is X-ray pump probe or XPP. Uh, that, that forms the suite of experiments in the first experimental hall. Then down in the far experimental hall, we have another three experiments which use only hard X-rays. We use only the shortest wavelengths of light. And those are X-ray correlation spectroscopy or XCS. Uh, um, coherent X-ray imaging, CXI, and that will be uh, biological imaging uh, primarily. And then finally, uh, MEC, or materials under in extreme conditions. Uh, as somebody uh, said to me recently, we, we have mastered the art of the TLA, or the three-letter acronym here at uh, SLAC. <laughs> I think you have. <laughs> There's a lot of TLAs. Uh, it was kind of fun. Of I, I had not heard that before. I guess it comes from business school. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, 
Um, I'm ne- going to need to take a very quick break. This hour of Dr. Kiki's Science Hour is brought to you by Audible.com. And I'd like to thank Audible.com for sponsoring us. Audible.com is the largest provider of audiobook content on the web. They have a library of over 75,000 different titles. They have titles ranging from periodicals like science news i like that one all the way to science fiction to non-fiction biographies all sorts of stuff and uh this week uh i have a book that i would like to suggest to you that you could actually get if you start a free trial with audible today so if you start right now you go to audiblepodcast.com forward slash kiki and you can check out let me see if i can bring up the um bring up the web page here searching 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 for audible.com there we go i was looking around trying to figure out what would be a a good recommendation for uh, for our audible pick of the week this week and i decided that the Feynman lectures would be pretty awesome physics, particle physics, and Feynman. And you can find almost all of the Feynman lectures on audible.com. This one I'm suggesting are the Feynman lectures on physics, volume 20, the very best lectures. But there are many more that you can choose from. He uh, He's lecturing on, he's lectured on, he lectured on many different topics. And so if you sign up for Audible podcast, uh, for Audible today, going to audiblepodcast.com forward slash Kiki, you can download the Feynman lectures or at least one of the volumes as your free audiobook download as a gift from audio, from audio, from Audible as a thanks for trying out their service. That's once again, audiblepodcast.com forward slash Kiki. You get a free audiobook download. You can pick what you want, but I'm suggesting Feynman because he was a pretty great lecturer. You got to admit it. So thanks once again to Audible for sponsoring this hour of Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. And those of you out there, if you haven't already done so, check out Audible. Audiblepodcast.com forward slash Kiki. Get a free audio book to take with you wherever you want to go, whenever, as long as you have a portable media device. It's easy. John, I'd love to um, to find out. There's been some some really interesting research that that's been published over the last month that's been that's been coming out hollow atoms do you know careful anything? fragile or hollow no um, this is a very interesting concept can you explain it to me certainly so typically when we ionize an, an atom we either take out one electron from somewhere in its inner shell so now I'm going to back up and say we think of the electronic structure of atoms very much in this Bohr model, which you probably remember as sort of a planetary-like model with the nucleus at the center like the sun and a series of concentric rings with with electrons in them, which the distance from the core is indicative of the binding energy. So the ones that are close to the nucleus are more tightly bound and the ones further from the nucleus are less tightly bound and we can usually take out one of those electrons using a synchrotron light source or using a bright light source like a laser with an intense beam we can start taking out many electrons but we do that from the outside and so we call that you know peeling the onion from the outside and we can create highly charged uh, atoms we can take off all the electrons even with the LCLS, we have sort of the best of both worlds. We have an X-ray beam, so we can interact with the inner shell electrons. We have enough energy to take out one of those innermost electrons. We also have enough intensity to take out a second one of those uh, electrons. So we can take out two of the inner shell electrons at the same time, or even more, uh, depending on the atom and depending on the, the duration of the pulse. So we depend on both on the very short time scale of the X-ray pulse because that electron or that atom with an electron missing in its inner shell is very unstable. The electrons from the outside are going to shove their way in and refill that that hole, just like if you tried to take water out of the bottom of a glass, the rest of the water is going to fall down and fill in the space that you took it out from. Um, But we're going fast enough with our X-ray beam, we have enough intensity that we can beat that and take out another electron uh, and and create some exotic states of matter. And, And, you know, it has no direct application that I can think of, but neither did lasers when they were first invented for, for that matter. <laughs> Everybody thought lasers were a very pretty toy and you could amuse your cat with them, as you said earlier, but that was about it. Uh, and of course, they're in, in so many uh, things that we have nowadays uh, have lasers in them. Um, 
But, uh, you know, we're in this situation of, of creating exotic states of matter and, and trying to understand them from the theoretical perspective because we have models that we use to explain how matter behaves in, in radiation fields or how it behaves in the presence of light. And we're validating those models for other cases, for situations where we can take out multiple electrons from the inner shell uh, and see how they behave. And it's the first time we've been able to do that. It's the, it's the first time we've had access to light that's short enough in duration and intense enough in, in, uh, in, in its intensity to be able to do such an experiment. So uh, as scientists, we like to, to do that. We're like explorers. You can't leave any, any pieces of the map not colored in. You've got to go and look at them all. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun. So I'm just, I'm just trying to think about the... Uh not have not having a real purpose to it, but just um, <laughs> the are we finding are you finding right now the the research that's come out recently? Have you actually found and and validated the idea that when you knock out electrons from the center of uh, from the interior of the electron shell, then the exterior are they are you seeing electrons fall in to replace oh, yeah. them? Is that is oh. that what's happening? Oh, absolutely. And that, that's something that was discovered, I believe, about 100 years ago um, or, or so. Uh, both uh, X-rays are generated in this way by knocking electrons out of the uh, inner shells of, of metal atoms in a, in a metal um, anode, in a you know, copper cathode uh, or a copper anode in a, uh, an X-ray tube, for example. You hit it with an electron beam, knock electrons out. Those electrons that are in the valence shell or in the metal conduction band fall in to fill those holes and release energy in, in in the way of photons or x-rays and also uh, another method of, of filling the holes are Auger decays where other electrons are knocked out and carry away the excess energy from the process um, of the electrons falling in to fill these inner shells and so we, we use both of those methods we use both uh, both uh, x-ray emission spectroscopy and Auger electron spectroscopy actually to characterize the uh, the states that we're creating, to characterize these double shell uh, or double core hole uh, states that uh, that are created, um, or hollow atoms, uh, if you wish. <laughs> so they were, were these, auto, uh, these hollow atoms, the idea of the hollow atom, this is something that was modeled and was uh, theoretically thought possible but now you've actually shown it to be possible and yeah it's you know it's actually been accessed in the past through some very minor processes uh that you can you can it, with one x-ray photon sometimes knock out two electrons but it's such a minor process that you have to look very hard for it here it's a it's a quite a major process it's something like 10 or 15 percent of of all of the inner shell ionizations are uh, resulting in these hollow atoms so we see a lot of them um when we when we focus the beam onto a, onto a target of, of atoms i think we might have a uh, a caller right now i just want to see if uh, if he's calling in are you there I opened up the line, but it's not working. No somehow. one was there. Yeah, somehow something is not working. Maybe it's my maybe it's my fault here. <laughs> Too much technology. It, but it's I'm not I'm not dealing with a collider here. There are no laser beams. <laughs> Trust me, neither am I. They've got a big crew of people to run this accelerator. I, I use the end of it. They, I call them up. My, my interface is picking up the phone and saying, I want a different color of x-rays or a different wavelength of light. And, and many very smart and very dedicated people jump into action and make that happen. That was fun. Mm, that was exciting. You know. No, I think, I think there is something wrong with what's happening here. Hmm, that's too bad. I really wanted to let people ask questions. That's too bad. So I guess I will take away the phone number because that's not working. Oh, bummer. 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 Um, somebody in the chat room actually uh, was wondering, um, what were they wondering? They were wondering, see if I can scroll through and find the questions that, that were here. Um, is this going to, what you're doing here, going to have any application for for um, energy, um, like the uh, fusion reactor, the National Ignition Facility, or is this going to have any, um, or is there anything that falls over into that realm? Well, energy, absolutely, there'll be, there'll be uh, applications in, in energy. Um, I'm trying to think of some. Um, so, in, in all materials to 
to harvest energy from the sun or from other processes, you have to understand how the electrons move in the system and electrons couple with the motion of atoms and, and strange things can happen. You know, these are all quantum particles uh, moving in, in small times and, and space scales. So you can get some very strange behavior that's uh, not something you would uh, necessarily think of when you wire up a, a solar cell. Um, and, and to understand those processes at their fundamental level is going to be, you know, critical to engineering new solutions to, uh, to harvest light. You know, photovoltaic cells in silicon are still miserably uh, efficient. You know, their efficiency is miserable, right? We, if we could find ways to make them uh, in increase their efficiency by 5 or 10 percent, you'd have a real blockbuster on your hands um, and, and be able to, uh, you know, change the way we consume energy. Maybe we would have energy that was too cheap to meter at that point, uh, unlike the 1950s uh, nuclear uh, energy ideas. <laughs> exactly. Moving, I was trying to find some more questions from the chat room. Uh, I will take questions from the chat room if you have any, so go ahead and put them up there. I will keep an eye out as the chat room sc scrolls past. Um, so there's a question from Web3925, if the linear accelerator can be modeled into, <laughs> can it be modeled into a microwave to make popcorn? <laughs> um, so Real world well, benefits, maybe. No, this is, this is interesting. So uh, there's, there, there is a connection there that, that we use microwaves to accelerate the electrons. So we have um, devices called klystrons, which generate intense um, microwave radiation and that microwave radiation is piped into the accelerator and that's the field that we use to accelerate the electrons and if you look inside your microwave oven which i don't encourage you to do you will find a, a klystron in the back of it um that's very similar device to uh maybe we can accelerate popcorn kernels up to the speed of light and see <laughs> if we can generate photons with those <laughs> that would be fun i think their mass would kind of get in the way maybe yeah i guess they are you know as, as light, well, I guess the, the kernels themselves are maybe aerodynamic, but... <laughs> Depends which direction they're facing, yes. <laughs> the pointy part first. Yeah. Um, so how, another question from the chat room, how much energy is required to hollow out an atom? Um, not a lot of energy. Um, so each electron is bound in the neon atom uh, with about 870 eV binding energy. So the first one comes off easily. The second one requires a little bit more energy to, to take it out. So we need two photons of something on the order of 1000 eV. Um, so it's not a lot of energy. The problem is they have to be in the same place and time uh, to, in order to, to do that. And uh, that's, that's the trick to it. I thought the question was be how much energy does it take to run the LINAC? And we actually have a, we have a, a wall plug sort of meter in the control room that shows that we, uh, we consume up to 20 megawatts of, of current to run the LINAC to produce these X-rays to make hollow atoms. Wow. What is that compared to other, to other uh, colliders? I know that I've, I've heard the, the rumor that, uh, that CERN, the mm -hmm. LHC, that they have to actually like, turn off the lights in Geneva. To be, able, to be able to run it, <laughs> uh, um, you know, they're they're similar. It's you know, there are big magnets involved, and and the the processes are are efficient by the scale of of these things um, for accelerators. But unfortunately, they uh, there's a lot of energy that goes into heat in, in generating uh, high energy particles, and so we have to have you know cooling water and cooling towers to exchange that heat back out. And of course, we recycle as much of it as we can, but. Uh, there's a lot of uh, electricity that goes into generating hot water in the end, um, just because the whole the whole system is is somewhat inefficient. Um, but it's the best the best that we know how to do. Yeah, part of the process of actually looking at the uh, the material that you're looking at um, the the X-rays end up destroying the material in the end, mm -hmm. do they not? So, yeah. um, at, so you're just trying to take the pictures right before they end up being destroyed. Right. So that's, uh, that's a, an interesting uh, area to explore uh, because matter moves on this time scale of, of femtoseconds. If we can 
take the picture before the atoms move, then we'll have a picture of the of the molecule. So, for example, if we're looking at a biological molecule, a protein, and we want to see what its structure is, if we hit it with enough intensity, all of those atoms are going to go flying out of the protein because we're going to strip the electrons off and we're going to be left with a bunch of nuclei, positively charged nuclei, sort of sitting there looking at each other going, whoa, I'm out of here. And, and they fly away um, because of the repulsion of the like charges. But if we can have a, an X-ray pulse that's short enough that it all happens that it passes through the material before it has a chance to move, then we'll get a picture of the material before it's been destroyed, um, rather than uh, rather than this blurry picture that you'd get with a longer X-ray pulse. There's a, uh, a qu another question in the chat room wondering um, if if this laser is something that could be used to measure gravity waves. If there's any relation at all. So all lasers could be used to measure gravity waves. The problem is getting two of these because you need the two arms, um, you know, in the LIDO, in the, uh, can't remember the name of the gravity wave. Is it observatory. LIDO? LIDO, I think? Yeah, I believe LIDO. so. It's, uh, <laughs> um, and then, you know, they're talking about putting one out in space. Um, but, you know, in, the, in their case, they need extremely stable laser beams. They need to, to have a very good handle on the intensity uh, and the wavelength of the, of the laser. And, you know, this is the first hard X-ray free electron laser. There have been other free electron lasers that have make vacuum ultraviolet light or soft X-rays, you know, wavelengths that uh, correspond to energies down to about 200 EV. Uh, but this is the first time we're getting into this range of kilovolts where we can start to use the X-rays to scatter off of materials and, and study their uh, structural properties. And, you know, as such, it's it's quite a chaotic beast, so probably wouldn't be appropriate for uh, for that application at this time. As you're uh, looking into the future of uh, oh. of what, just a minute while I get my Merlin hat That's on. That's right. Be ready. <laughs> That's oh, <laughs> prognosticate oh. scientific prognostication here. Um, we uh, we're looking at what what do you see coming out of uh, the LCLS? over the next few years that's going to be, or at least what research is being done that's going to be really interesting if uh, things go as, as scientists hope that it will. Um, and do you, looking even further forward, even though this still, you know, the application, the practical application of, mm -hmm. of the information that comes out of it, do you foresee anything really interesting coming out, like in communications with the really, really fast x-rays or... Um, you know, just any of the new technologies that are developed to be able to actually do the yeah. work that you're doing. Oh, it's that's a difficult question because there's going to be so much great research that's going to go on here. And you know, if I pick one, I'm going to going to piss off uh, several others. But I will pick <laughs> I will pick one because I've not been known to piss people off before. Um, and and that's the sort of the reason the LCLS was built. What well, the scientific case for the LCLS included this this idea that we could study proteins, we could solve the, the structure of a protein molecule. And over the past, I would say, 20 years, we've uh, scientists have used synchrotrons to study the structure of proteins um, by, by first growing crystals of proteins. So you can isolate the proteins uh, you know, using a lot of, a lot of chemistry and, and biology to grow the proteins in the first place, get them to crystallize into macroscopic sized crystals, just like your table salt. So they're proteins arranged in a regular array, a regular lattice inside of this crystal. And they take these crystals, which are you know, on the order of the size of 100 microns to a millimeter, put them in an X-ray beam, scatter the X-rays through the crystal, you know, measure the scattering pattern, and then using uh, mathematics, solve the structure of the protein, uh, understand where all of the atoms are. And this has been very important in, in uh, mechanistic biology and in physical biology and understanding how proteins work. Proteins are the machine molecules in, in life. They, they do things. They, they move calcium atoms. They, you know, they move oxygen atoms or, or move oxygen around the, the body, whatever. So they're very important uh, in understanding life. And understanding the relationship between structure and function is, is, of course, very important. It turns out that I think it's on the order of 30% of proteins don't exist or don't live in a in a place that they can easily be isolated and crystallized so uh, a lot of the proteins that have been solved i think there's something on the order of 60,000 or 100,000 proteins uh in the structural data bank are 
uh, intracellular proteins or, or inter, yeah, in, in sort of dissolved in water. Some 30% of the proteins in the in living things, though, live in the lipid bilayer or in the in the membranes of, of cells and can't be easily isolated and more importantly crystallized, made to grow together. So we can't put a collection of them into a crystal and study their structure using an X-ray beam at a synchrotron. But there's hope that we can take those individual proteins and drop them into the X-ray beam of the LCLS, scatter this very intense X-ray beam off of a single molecule and measure the X-ray pattern or measure the diffraction pattern. And that won't provide enough information to solve the structure. But if we repeat that, if we do that a million times, there we hope that there will be enough information that we can solve the structure of the proteins in that way. We've already done some of that in that we've studied the structure of, micro, of proteins in microcrystals, so very small crystals, crystals that have you know a thousand protein molecule, a thousand replicas of the protein molecule in them, so that they're 10 nanometers by 20 nanometers in size. They're quite small uh, crystals, something that you couldn't use at a synchrotron X-ray source. And we do these small crystals and hit them with a pulse of X-rays uh, and and study the structural. Uh, or study the X-ray diffraction patterns and, and can then turn that around and solve the structure of the molecules in there. And that's how we uh, studied, for example, Photosystem 1 uh, at the LCLS uh, and other proteins. So it's, uh, I think that's going to be a big application. It's still uncertain that it will work on individual molecules, but even if we can do these small uh, crystals, it's a big it's a big leap forward in being able to solve the structures of some very important proteins um, for you know disease and uh, and and life in general. Um, so that's probably I think the big application in the next few years. But you know everything is a is a big application. There's you know trying to understand magnetization dynamics um, right. when you magnetize an, uh, a collection of atoms that process happens on the order of femtoseconds. So gee whiz, what a great source we have here to study that. Um, you know, there's been work over the past decade using x-rays to study magnetic devices because there are certain edges in, in elements that you can illuminate. You can illuminate the cobalt in a, in a magnetic layer and, and understand how it's, how it's behaving and how it's changing when you change the magnetization. And so that's a, an effort. Um, you know, I could go on and on. <laughs> and there's, I there's love that. Of, there's I a lot of fun stuff great. to do here. Um, so will it, uh, will it find practical application? Was that the second part of the question? Yeah. Uh, do, you see, do, you, do you foresee anything, you know, coming out of it? Things like uh, you, you mentioned with lasers, what yeah. was, people didn't really know what was going to come yeah. out of it. And yeah. Then... No, yeah. So in, in that sense, yes, I think, you know, information, understanding of nature, understanding how matter reacts uh, on the timescales that we can probe uh, is critical to being able to move from sort of just observing matter to being able to control matter. Because if we're going to control how chemical reactions proceed, if we're going to control how, uh, how materials assemble, we're going to have to understand it on this timescales because this is how it moves. This is how it, how it behaves. So uh, you know, anything that we can do to advance our understanding of that is going to give us uh, uh, finer knobs to control matter uh, and, and make it serve our purposes. Blah. It makes Blah. me sound like a mad scientist I again. I love it. I love yeah. it. <laughs> you know, we're going to control everything, starting with your mind. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me today. We are running out of time, and um, I'm so. sure there's so much more that we could continue to discuss. There's, um, you know, all the other. There are so many projects happening, and so many, so much information. You are a font of knowledge. I love oh, this. Oh wow! <laughs> maybe, we, maybe we've just reached the bottom. That's it. There's no more. I got nothing more. I'm sorry. Yeah. So uh, this uh, this facility was how many years in the making? It was four or five years in the making, five years at least, or more than that. Uh, you know, so it was funded five or six years ago. I can't remember off the top of my head. Uh, the ideas came up 20 years ago to use the uh, LINAC to create an X-ray free electron laser. So uh, these time, these these big projects have a long gestation scale. And about how how long do you do you hope and expect it to be finding answers about our universe? Oh, I think for the next uh, 20 years at least, and hopefully long beyond that, we will be continuing to improve it, continuing to capitalize on the investment that we have already made here at SLAC uh, to be doing great science. Once again, thank you very much. This has been a great hour, and I, I know from looking at the chat room, people have been, been very excited about this conversation and have been appreciating it as well. There are many more questions that were not able to be answered today, unfortunately. Um, if anybody is interested in uh, more information, you can go to the following websites. You can go to lcls. Uh, what was it? Slack. 
Slack.com. It changed it. Slack portal. Slack.stanford.edu. Slack. Thank you. Sl- and then it, yeah, it redirects you. But it's it LCLS. Me. So Slack.stanford.edu is the main Slack website. And from there, you can go to user facilities on that top uh, blue bar and pull down LCLS. You can also look at SSRL while you're there right. if you're interested, and you can learn all about the LCLS. That's right. And there's a, a bunch of really great information there. There are uh, plenty of diagrams of the instruments, descriptions of everything that they're, that they're doing there, uh, news about the recent results that have been published in uh, top journals uh, around the world, and, um, and much, much more. This has been... <laughs> been really 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 great i've really enjoyed it and um if are you are, are you online anywhere social media anything like that uh, that you'd like to share with people if people are interested i'm not on any of the social media things yet i've been avoiding it because i've had a very busy <laughs> project for the past couple of years trying to assemble things but uh they right. can probably find my email address uh, on that website um right. and i'd be happy to uh, to talk with them or answer questions uh, for anybody Great. So we will we will send people just just go to Slack, look around, yeah. LCLS, have, yep. look for you John Bozak. You have to Bozak. look hard and find my web, find my email address so that you'll uh, you'll enjoy looking at all of the information before you find it. Yes, great. And anybody else uh, out there who's been anybody out there who's been watching this whole time? Thank you very much for joining us this hour. It's been a, a lot of fun learning all about the uh, Linux coherent light source and the research that's going on there at Slack National Accelerator Laboratory. Once again, thanks to John Bozek for joining us this hour. And if you are interested in um, finding past episodes of Dr. Kiki's Science Hour, you can go to twit.tv forward slash Kiki. There's all sorts of episodes in audio and video formats you can download to your heart's content. We're also uh, in iTunes. And additionally, I believe there's some video on YouTube. We're all over the place. I'm even on your Roku box. And if you want, let me see if I can, if I can uh, find this very quickly. If you want to give me a call, I have a voicemail number set up so that you can actually... Call me and leave me a voicemail, ask me a question, or uh, make a comment about the show, anything, any topics that have been been discussed, and um, maybe I'll play it on the show next week. You can call 5, oh wait, no, what's my phone number? So you can call 650-741-5454. That's 650-741-5454. Five four five four six five zero seven four one Kiki. It's kind of easy, right? Wow. Yeah. Well, got my got my name in there, so you can actually wow. get in touch with me more marketing, easily. Marketing. Marketing. Good That's job. That's right. Yes. Once again, six five zero seven four one five four five four. That is my voicemail. My G Google Voice uh, number. You can give me a call about the show. That's not my phone. That's me. (laughs) Am I done? Can I go answer my phone? Yes. Thank you for joining me, John. My pleasure. Bye. Bye, Kiki. Uh, Anybody else out there? Let's see. Until next week. Next week, we are going to be talking about more science-y good news. And um, you can find me online at drkiki.tv or at drkiki on Twitter, or you can Google Dr. Kiki. Um, I'll see you next week. I think that's it for now. So thanks for watching. And until next week, remember, just one hour a week makes your world a whole lot more interesting. Interesting.